Welcome back to the Future Print Tech Fest. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Mr. Renzo Tripp, who is a principal engineer at Czar. Welcome, Renzo. Thank you. Thank you. And um, where where are you? I always say the word dialing in. Of course, that's a very old fashioned way of saying where are you basically in the world right uh, now? So I'm in Stockholm, Sweden. Stockholm, Sweden. I believe you are actually a Dutch national. Is that right? Uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you studied um, applied physics at Delft University and then followed that up at Stockholm with a PhD in fluid mechanics. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously then that means that you're well versed to talk about um, the technical elements of inkjet. Um, have, having said all of that, of course, we've, ju we've just talked in you, you, this presentation. I think it's going to be brilliant for people that have a, a fundamental understanding, but not necessarily at your level. Mm -hmm. Is that fair to say? No, absolutely. Okay. So this session I'm really looking forward to. The title is intriguing. It's called Rock and Roll, Direct to Shape Applications. So I'm going to hand the presentation over to you now, Renzo. Okay. Thank you. Uh... Thank you, Marcus. Yeah, so let's rock and roll. Uh, so that actually refers to the motion of the print that, that we will be investigating. Uh, and that's then related to direct to shape applications. But let me start by uh, introducing uh, the other contributors to this presentation, which is besides myself, Angus Gondi, uh, Director of Technology at XAR. And uh, the project was initiated by Werner Zepka, who is now a consultant. Now, also, I would like to acknowledge the iPrint Institute for Printing for their support, because uh, there we have actually made the videos that I will show in this presentation. So specifically, Olivier, uh, thank you for your support. Okay, so let's um, uh, first give an introduction of what is what do we mean by direct to shape applications. So by that we mean digital inkjet printing directly onto uh, packaging or products. Uh, so when, when you do this, then it might actually be advantageous to not have the printer uh, or the printhead in down shooter mode, but actually hold it vertically or in skyscraper mode, as we say. Uh, you can think of a bottle, for example. When yet other applications uh, that maybe uh, are larger, uh, then you may have to move the printhead instead of the object. And you can do that by using a gantry system or a robotic arm. Now, when you do that, the printhead will change its orientation dynamically, and it will also experience some acceleration. So the questions that we have set out in this uh, presentation is what effect does a change of orientation and what does acceleration actually do to the printhead performance? Can you still print when you hold the printhead upside down? Now, to answer these questions, uh, we have to consider the nozzle pressure. So let me just explain that uh, with some simple schematics. So what I show here is a nozzle plate with one nozzle in it. Uh, and we see the ink in orange. So if you have a nicely controlled print head, then we make sure that the pressure inside the nozzle is slightly below atmospheric pressure. For an obvious reason, if it would be larger, then we would get ink weeping onto the nozzle plate and that would then prevent droplets from being ejected. And there's also another extreme, which is if we put uh, uh, the pressure too low, then we would actually start to suck in air. So we get air ingestion. So there's a window where we have to keep the nozzle pressure in order to print reliable. Now the XR print head actually controls the nozzle pressure by controlling the supply pressure and the return pressure. And this then also allows us to control the flow rate through the print head. Now that's very handy. Uh, and I can explain that by this insert. So what we do is we supply ink and we return ink through a manifold. And this uh, ink is actually circulated directly behind the nozzle. So should we get any ingestion of air bubbles, then these are actually carried away, which makes the nozzle, uh, uh, the mix, which makes the print that very robust. Uh, and also uh, uh, actually causes the nozzle pressure window to be very large, which you need in these type of applications. Now, in order to investigate what happens when you change the orientation or when you uh, uh, call some acceleration, we need an experimental setup. And as already mentioned, this is located at the iPrint Institute for uh, Printing in Marley, Switzerland. So what we use is a robotic arm uh, that's a Staupli six-axis robot, uh, and we mount the printhead on the robot end effector. Now let's have a closer look at that. So what we show here is the XR printhead all the way on the bottom. And above the printhead, as close as possible, for reasons that I will explain later, we have the XR Hydra sensor manifold. And it's here that the pressure centers are located that measure the supply and return pressure that we need to control the nozzle pressure. 
Now, the pressure sensors are part of a control loop, so we can actually control the pressure by steering some pumps. And these are located in the ink supply system, which is not mounted on the robotic arm. So the ink supply system is actually located next to the printhead and is stationary, or next to the robotic arm and is stationary. Now, besides the sensor manifold and the printhead, we also have some electronics mounted on the uh, end effector. Finally, we also need a tool to actually analyze what happens to the droplets when they are ejected. And for that, we use uh, a drop watcher. So um, that's what we sh show here. So first of all, we find the printhead, which is uh, most, most clearly recognizable by the 099 number on the site. And the printhead is actually ejecting droplets into a sponge, which is our simple catcher in this case. Furthermore, we have a light source, which is an LED behind the droplets. And what we do is we then rec actually record the shadow of the droplets by a camera and suitable optics. And we time all of this with an FPGA card. So what that then looks like is something like this. So what we have here is we have a screen with the shadow of droplets. And we clearly recognize here the A, B, and C cycle that's characteristic for the shared wall XR printhead. What we can do is we can use now the distance and also the print frequency to uh, measure or to analyze to obtain uh, the drop velocity. Now, in more advanced applications, you may choose to use a double exposure, but the, uh, as we will see, the robotic arm is quite violent, so that would here induce large measurement errors. Now, we are pushing here to the limits, so sometimes we will see a disturbed print or maybe even print altogether. So then we cannot measure the drop velocity, so then we will report a velocity that's equal to zero. And of course, we will explain why the print failed in this case. Okay, so now let's start with the first series of experiments, whereby we only change the orientation of the printhead. So changing the orientation we do here by applying a rotational motion around the tool center point. That's a robotic arm uh, term. So the tool center point is the point around which we're going to rotate, in this case, the printhead. Now the tool center point can lie on top of the nozzle plate, uh, can lie in front of the nozzle plate, but can also lie behind uh, the nozzle plate, so behind the printhead. Now, in any of these cases, uh, we rotate the printhead around this point, and we're going to look what happens then to the uh, droplets ejected. And actually, we start with the case here on the left. We do this very slowly. We're not going to uh, uh, do this very fast, because we only are interested in what happens when you change the orientation, and not yet what happens when you accelerate the printhead. So okay, let's have a look here. So we have here a video on the top right corner. And we see already the printhead in motion. And it's maybe a bit difficult to recognize the printhead here, but maybe look at the camera, which is perpendicular to the printhead. So now the printhead is actually uh, shooting downwards, and now it's printing uh, to the side. Now we repeat this motion downwards, and then it prints droplets to the other side. Now what we see is that uh, in the bottom right corner, we see actually this recording of these droplets by that camera. And we see there's actually a bit of a velocity change. And we can see that more clearly in the graph that we show here on the left. So we see here in the middle graph, we see that the velocity starts out very constant. And then we get a velocity deficit. The velocity drops a little bit every time the printhead is in the downmost position. Uh, and we see that for each time that the printhead goes to, through this downshooting position. And we also report here the pressure, so the nozzle pressure that we measure with the sensor manifold. Uh, and that's the bottom graph on the left. But there we don't see a significant change. So what's going on here? Well, that we can see in the next graph. So what we have to consider here is that the uh, printhead and the sensor manifold are actually at an offset to one each other. And that's an in the direction of gravity. So what happens that when we measure the pressure inside the sensor manifold, then that's actually a bit, a bit less than the pressure that we actually have at the nozzle, because there we also have the weight of the fluid in this column acting. So there is a, an off, a difference there in these pressures. And that's not a problem in static, uh, in static um, applications, because we can just compensate for that. Because this, uh, this is just linked to the, to the offset or high difference between these uh, two and the ink density. And that's also exactly how we do it. But when we now change the orientation of the printhead, then this offset, so for example, in this case, is now, is now zero. Because now, uh, if we look in the direction of gravity, we see that both the nozzles and the sensors, they are both at the same height. So if we uh, take this position to set our offset compensation, so we have none, zero, and as soon as we now rotate back into the downshooting orientation, then we actually have that additional pressure. So 
yeah, then the pressure changes. Let us add a few more cases. So first of all, we see here case one uh, in the graph. So what, we, what I report here is that change in pressure that we now know is, is, is there. And we also report the change in velocity that we have observed. Right, and we add to this a few more cases. So first of all, case two. That was that case where we had the tool center point in front of the nozzle plate. But this doesn't change the change uh, or the difference in, in offset. That's the same. So we find also a velocity deficit that is almost the same. Now, if we then go to case three and case four, where the um, uh, tool center point is now uh, behind the printhead, we actually start in down shooting orientation and then we rotate the printhead until it's completely inverted. Now, first I must mention that you can actually do that. So it's perfectly fine to print, the, uh, to print upside down. Actually, as soon as the droplet has left the printhead, uh, uh, gravity has a very insignificant role, so at least for a reasonable throw distances. Uh, now for these last two cases, the actual change in offset is actually twice as large as what we saw for case one and two. And what we see is that also the drop velocity deficit is twice as large. So what you can conclude from this is that the drop velocity deficit is inversely proportional to the nozzle pressure. Okay, but how can we explain that then? Well, for that again, we have to return to our simple sketches of the nozzle. So let's say that in a normal condition, we have the top case here. So that's the target nozzle pressure. So of course, slightly negative, otherwise we would get ink weeping onto the nozzle plate. Now, if we now get that in, uh, additional uh, pressure from that weight of that fluid above the nozzle, then we actually get a little bit more fluid in the nozzle. Now, what happens if you get more fluid, then your mass increases, but we still have the same force uh, to eject the droplet. So that then must mean that acceleration is less, so we get a smaller drop velocity. And that's exactly what we saw in the graphs. So that's for changing orientation. So what happens then when you accelerate the printhead? Now for that, just to make it simple, we start with just a unidirectional motion and we stop changing the orientation of the printhead. So we just choose one. So we could choose down shooter, horizontal or vertical, but we chose here to do the down shooter orientation, which is the most intuitive one. But we have also checked the other ones and the results that I show here are, uh, are similar for the other orientations. So what we do is that we move the printhead along a straight line in an oscillatory fashion so that we can see nicely and repeatable what happens uh, to the drops uh, being ejected. We better start with a slow case. So here we only accelerate the printhead with a maximum acceleration of one meter per second squared. So we lift the printhead up as we can see in the top right corner and then we start this oscillatory motion. And we can now very nicely see in the bottom right corner that the droplets actually slow down and accelerate, whereby the acceleration is most clearly shown by satellites behind the main droplet. So what's going on here? Well, let me just pick two very specific points, starting with um, the, the point where the, uh, the printhead is in the most downward position. So this is the first time it has moved from the top to the bottom. And this is actually the point where the printhead is now starting just to go up again. So what we get actually is that the ink due to inertia, that, that still wants to go further down. So actually we have here a little bit larger pressure, very similar to what we saw for a change of orientation. A larger nozzle pressure leads to more ink in the nozzle. And that's why the, we, we see that there's actually uh, a lower velocity. And that's exactly what we see in the graph here on the left as well. Now, if we then go to the other extreme, so when we have to print that in the highest position, so now we have actually the opposite case. So the print that has just reached the top position and starts its descent uh, down, but the ink still wants to continue up. And as a result, there's a little bit less fluid in the nozzle. And as a result, we will see an increase in the drop velocity. So you can actually understand what happens here. This is a very systematic behavior. There is one component that I haven't discussed yet, and that is the pressure in the nozzle that we measure with the sensor manifold. And we see that in the bottom uh, graph on the left. So we see that this is just a bit oscillating. So what happens here is that this motion is, uh, is slow enough such that the ink system still registers it, but it's unable to respond to it. And that raises the question, what would happen if you would go faster? So that's what we do in the next graph. And let's just see what happens. So we move here at four meters per second squared. Okay, so we see that this is already quite a, a violent rocking motion. Uh, and actually we see that uh, ejection fails and that's at this particular point. So where we, uh, again, when we reach the lowest point of the printhead, now there's uh, the inertia is so strong that ink is actually weeping onto the nozzle plate. 
Now, when that happens, this layer of fluid is actually too thick to still eject droplets through. And that's why Drexen fills. Uh, and that's also what we see in the bottom right graph here. But fortunately, we have XR TF technology. So Prince actually restored without that we have to do any maintenance steps or have to purge ink or have to stop the print. Uh, so that's the positive side, but there's something else here. So if you now look at the bottom uh, left graph, we see here the pressure. And we see now that there's this uh, peak in pressure, which you would expect it's consistent with uh, ink weeping onto the nozzle plate. But after this initial peak, we actually have a reduced pressure, and that then prevents the, uh, uh, the print or the ejection of droplets to fill in later oscillations. So we only see that for the first time we reach the lowest point, but not thereafter. So when we saw this, we thought maybe we can actually do a smart trick. What if we don't start with the maximum acceleration, but we just slowly accelerate uh, the print at? So we slowly increase the maximum acceleration that we have during an oscillation. And that's what I'm going to show you in the next video. So again, we lift the print up, uh, the print head up first, and try to look both at the motion of the print head and the drop ejections. So at this point, the print that has reached the maximum acceleration, which is 10 meters per second squared. And this is actually scary to stand next to, but the drops are still ejecting. So the print is very reliable. So while the print that is slowing down again, we can actually have a look at the pressure. So we see now that we have avoided this large initial pressure peak, and that then helps to prevent droplets from failing to being ejected. Of course, we do still have uh, a variation in drop velocity, but this is very systematic. So it's possible to actually um, uh, uh, take countermeasures against this. And that brings us to the uh, summary and conclusions of this presentation. So what we have shown is that you can print the print that in any orientation, uh, the standard down shooting mode, in vertical mode, but even when completely inverted, that doesn't matter. And as I said, the gravity only plays a, uh, uh, is not significant, or doesn't play a significant role once the droplets have been ejected, at least at reasonable throw distances. Now, we did see that in the standard system, as we sell it today, uh, we only have a, st a, a static compensation of the offset between the pressure sensors and the nozzle. So this is something you would have to change. You would have to do a dynamic compensation thereof. Otherwise, you will see the drop velocity deficit or the drop velocity change that we have seen. And we also looked at acceleration. And we could show that you can accelerate the print at up to 10 meters per second squared, quite a, a, a rocking motion. But printing is still, uh, or the, the, the print is still ejecting droplets. So it's very reliable. Uh, the only thing you have to do is to make sure that you slowly ramp up this acceleration. And this is actually what you would do in a normal application, where you probably first reach a certain terminal velocity, which you then hold while you print. Now, we did see a case where printing failed, but then it also recovered uh, uh, promptly without that we had to do any maintenance steps. So that's also a huge advantage. Say that somewhere in your process, there's an event which causes printing to fail. Then you don't have to stop and purge, but you can just continue. Uh, which brings us to the conclusion that the XR printed is actually very suitable for direct to shape applications. We have shown that it's a robust and reliable print head. Uh, and that's mostly thanks to the large uh, nozzle pressure window, which you obtain uh, by the XR TF technology. Now, a reliable and robust print head, that's only a first step that we must say. So, we already mentioned that you have to uh, be able to control your pressure even in a dynamic way. So, when you have this offset changing. But there's a few other problems that you have to keep in mind. So we use here uh, a robotic arm. And robotic arms are very accurate. They are very accurate in moving from point A to point B. But they usually are not so good in following a very accurately a path between A and B. Uh, so in terms of, uh, of inkjet, we usually print along a straight line. But in order to move along a straight line, the robot has to change multiple axes, which then can lead to quite large drop placement errors. So you probably have to consider uh, quite considerable um, uh, um, uh, image processing in order to compensate for this. Uh, the last thing that I also already mentioned briefly is when you uh, print on large objects, which maybe have strange curves, uh, you may anticipate a bit larger throw distances. Uh, so that's definitely also something that's on our radar. 
uh, to investigate further. And that brings me to the end of this presentation. It's um, a really good presentation, not least because the, the, the video is very clear as well. So that, that really helped, um, particularly for me, who's not particularly technical. Um, is it fair to say this is a breakthrough technology? Because direct to shape, to be fair, has been around now for seven or eight years as, a, as an option, as a technology option. What you seem to be presenting there is, is a more sophisticated, robust um, technology that can really um, move in quite a fast speed as well. Is, it, would you, is that fair to say it's a breakthrough? No, absolutely. I think uh, um, uh, we really have have shown and investigated what we uh, what 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 are the what are yeah we haven't even reached the limits right because it was still printing, uh, and I think that's also uh, that people realize that you can actually do this to a print ad, so it's not a very vulnerable product, but you can actually yeah, do quite something with it, uh, and I think there's also. Uh, so we see uh, uh, environmental measures become more and more important. And that also, uh, we have seen that these markets are also interested, right? So can you replace uh, a spray painting uh, with, uh, with, for example, an inject technology? And then, of course, the first step is that you actually can uh, print reliable. Uh, and another step where that uh, I think the print is also very suitable at is the higher viscosities. Uh, mm. Uh, since it's quite a different uh, 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 fluid or ink that you try to deposit. So there are several steps, actually, that uh, that I think uh, show potential now for these markets. Right, exactly. Because back in the day, where, you know, imprint, I don't know, 2013, 14, direct, direct to shape was kind of the next big thing. and it, But it was always focused on, you know, cylindrical um, bottles and, and so on and so forth. What you're intimating there is that this direct to shape could be the fuselage of an aeroplane. It could be a car. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah that's fair assumptions. Yeah, that's absolutely the markets that you that you could have in mind. Yeah, yeah, that, that's exciting because that enables some some key savings, doesn't it? So if you're a, if if you're a, an aircraft manufacturer or 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 an airline owner and you need to respray your 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 aircraft, in doing it with it, what are the advantages of inkjet? Um, so, uh, so one uh, uh, advantage is, is that you don't have so much overspray. So when you would uh, like to print on an object such as a car or an airplane, uh, you probably have to mask a lot of parts where you don't want any ink to end up. Uh, and this can be a significant time and cost saving uh, to not have to do that. Now, the other thing is, is that, uh, for example, in the automotive industry, you will see that uh, it's actually quite uh, a lot of energy that goes into having a booth uh, to, to where you can do the spray painting. Mm -hmm. So if you can reduce the requirements for that, so it would be also a huge energy saving, actually. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. So if, I, if I'm a, a manufacturer, for instance, and I'm, I'm kind of like, well, I, this has given me some thoughts and ideas, how do we go about working with Czar? I mean, how, how would that work? So obviously you manufacture the heads, but do you work in partnership and collaboration with, with customers to help them integrate the right solution? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So I think... Uh, these projects, they require a, a lot of different expertises, right? So we have the robotic arm, which is, which is actually quite difficult, uh, uh, the ink and so on. So uh, I think we can be a partner that can support, uh, uh, let's say they can, can advise, what should you do with the print head? Uh, what do you need in terms of control uh, and so on? So I think that's the that's the way to go, to, to see if we, yeah, if we can help to make it happen. But a very reliable print head is a very good first step. Yeah, it's a brilliant first step. And then there's other things like the software, the drive electronics, the ink. So I guess, I guess, and I, you know, obviously Zara being an independent inkjet manufacturer, there's that advantage that you can work with, with within reason, whomever you like. Is that, is that right? Yeah, yeah that's a, that's a fair conclusion. Yeah. So, and yeah. I think in this kind of case, you will need multiple partners to make this happen. Yeah. Uh, and then just a good collaboration is, is, is yeah, is, is really what you need. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Well, congratulations on that development. It's really exciting. I, I look forward to seeing videos of you, you, you painting, or well, not painting, or using inkjet in, in, in aircraft manufacture and, and car and that in the future, because that, that, that really makes, I think, inkjet very industrial, doesn't it? Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Superb. So thanks so much for joining us. Um, great presentation. And um, if you want to, anybody wants to get in contact with Renzo, his profile will be on the website along with his email address and, and, and hopefully you get some inquiries and um, maybe some new ideas. So um, thanks again. Great. Thank you, Marcus.